Dr. Lee, welcome back to the podcast. Thanks very much, Doug. It's always a pleasure to speak to you. Likewise, and I'd love to to jump right in because I think a lot of people, um, they have a hard time when they're looking to lose weight, when they're looking to lose body fat. And, you know, you often hear people say like, you know, I want to lose like 15 pounds, 20 pounds, 30 pounds, and I don't know where to start. There's so much information out there. What would you say is like a big like weight loss myth that exists that people constantly believe? Man, there are so many myths out there about weight loss. I mean, I, I would sort of come at this really as a scientist and as a, a physician to say, even if you lose small amounts of weight, you actually gain large amounts of health benefit. For example, just losing even one to four pounds, which most people would, um, I think, would admit is not very much. That decreases your risk of heart failure, for example. And as you lose more and more weight, 10 pounds uh, starts to reduce your risk of breast cancer. Uh, more than that, and you start to reduce the risk of dying from any cause. I think that uh, getting started uh, with any type of weight loss is usually a healthy thing if you're carrying extra weight. Now, that goes to the next myth out there, which is that the scale tells you all. So look, all of us have had this experience. You know, you just step out of the shower, look in the corner of your eye, in the mirror, and you don't like what you see, and you curse yourself, and you go, man, I got to do something about that. Then you step on the scale. If that number isn't the one that you were expecting, you just curse again, and you're like, I got to lose some of that weight. Well, here's the deal. What the latest science of our metabolism and body fat tells us is that the scale doesn't give the whole story. Obviously, most people know when they are seriously overweight, all right? So I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the myth. The myth is that, you know, like if you feel like if you can, whatever the weight, come up with a number, 200 pounds, 150 pounds, whatever it is, man, my body size means I should drop a little bit less and I'll look better in the mirror. The mirror and the scale doesn't tell you exactly what's going on because the most, um, because weight, by the way, what you see, that number, is your bones. You need good, strong bones. You want your bones to be heavy and solid. Muscle, you need to have muscle, especially as you get older. Aging is like one of these things where you want to have protein and you want to build muscle. Muscle weighs. Water, hydration. You want to have hydration as well. So all these compartments all contribute to the, the number on the scale. But what you want to really yoke in and control is actually visceral fat. Viscera is the term we use uh, for gut. Gut fat, by the way, is not the stuff that you see in the mirror. It's not the love handles, the muffin top. It's not even really truly the beer belly. The visceral fat is the stuff that's inside the tube of your body. So you could have a skinny body and be loaded with this visceral fat inside. In fact, it's kind of like a styrofoam peanuts that you stuff a packing uh, container with. Uh, like a FedEx box, you pack it in, you can have a lot of peanuts in there uh, for a little package. And that's the dangerous stuff. So uh, that's one of the things that you really want to be able to beat is your visceral fat. And then I think the other thing, another myth that, you know, kind of like will help us jump right into the good news about all this is that um, the idea is that if you want to lose weight, you have to stop eating. You just have to eat. You just have to like cut off food. And that's not entirely true either, because now their new research shows us there are certain foods you can eat that will burn down that harmful visceral fat. You can actually eat foods to burn fat, which is kind of a counterintuitive thing, but that's what the science shows. So I think something else that people struggle with as we're talking about things that people can do is that a lot of people, and I speak from my own experience, who engaged in unhealthy habits for quite some time, didn't go to the gym, didn't eat healthy. They try to go into this all or nothing approach because they're like, all right, I'm seeing I need to eat more vegetables, more protein. I got to go to the gym. I got to do this. Like, where do I start? So what's your advice for somebody to be able to build some, some healthy habits that actually last so that they can begin to lose the weight that they might want to lose, improve their overall health, et cetera? Okay. This is a great question. And I'll, I'll give you my simplest answer that anybody can do. All right. So what you're going to hear when you talk to ask most people that question is, well, 
you should switch to a plant-based diet. You should become a vegetarian or maybe even a vegan, or you should fast. And yeah, if you starve yourself, you're going to actually lose weight for sure. Remember um, Tom Hanks in Castaway? You know, you, you fall out of a plane and you get on an island. If you don't eat, you're going to actually get real skinny. All right. That's your body digesting itself, consuming itself in order to stay alive. Being a vegetarian or a vegan, you know, you're cutting down your protein. That's not necessarily a good thing either. You have to really be very mindful and thoughtful about how to do it. Yes, there are ways of actually incorporating healthy amounts of uh, plant-based foods as a step, as an important step of having overall lifelong health. So I'm, I don't mean to degrade that as well, but what is the simple first step you can take? All right. Here's the thing. A lot of people don't realize that our metabolism, our body is hardwired to burn down harmful body fat that compromises our health and slows our metabolism. Our body's hardwired to do this, to burn that fat down when we're sleeping, because when we're sleeping, we're not eating, right? I mean, most people are not sleepwalking or sleep eating. And what happens is that when there's no food in your system, your metabolism shifts gears, just like uh, on a standard transmission of a car, of a race car, right? like your body, all right? But any car, if you haven't taken care of yourself, it just shifts that manual shift into fat burning mode when you're sleeping. Now, I mentioned something, I said something really critical when there's no food in your body. So if you want to actually very easily improve your overall health, through your metabolism and a, a small tweak in your diet. What I want you to do is to try to get eight hours of sleep. We know that that's good. Eat dinner at an early-ish time, you know, like seven or seven o'clock-ish is a good time to eat dinner. Most people will spend an hour, maybe hour or so eating dinner. And when you put your plates away in a dish uh, in the sink, after that, let's say at eight o'clock, you don't eat again. When you put your when the dishes get put away in the sink, Stop eating. No midnight snack. No late night ice cream. Don't go out for pizza at midnight. You know, all the things we used to do when we were much younger. Everyone can re re relate to that. No, you know, one more for the road and swig of beer, um, uh, you know, as you're, as you're watching the news late at night or whatever. Don't do it. Dishes in the sink and that's it. So what that does is that let's say that you do that at eight o'clock and you go to bed at 11 o'clock. I mean, I'm just making it up. So if you want to get uh, eight hours of sleep, you sleep from 11 to uh, uh, eleven o'clock at night to seven in the morning. But now you stop eating at eight, at eight o'clock when you put dishes away, eight to 11, you three hours. You've gained three hours where you're not putting food in your body. Those three hours that you've gained are three extra hours. Your body can shift into that metabolism activating, fat burning, health elevating mode. So let's do a little math. Three hours, you eat dinner. Put your, your dishes in the sink at eight. You don't eat again, no midnight snack until you go to bed, three hours. Now go to bed from 11 to seven. This is hypothetical. Everyone's going to be a little different. You got eight hours there. Three plus eight hours is 11 hours. Okay. Now one little extra pro tip here. And this is what I do in my own life. I get up in the morning, let's say at seven, or I'm just using that same example, following that example. And rather than do what my mom taught me to do when I was a kid. And I think a lot of us do this. You get out of bed, you hear your mom's voice going, okay, get down to the kitchen, eat some breakfast, you know, fill yourself up so you can get on with your day, right? That's what we all did as kids. Eat some breakfast, get in that school bus, don't be late for school. You need to have energy in order to be able to learn. Okay. However, here's what I do now as an adult. I get up in the morning, let's say it's seven. I don't eat for one hour after I get up. I might check my email. I might read a book. I might go, go for a walk. I might take a shower, take my time getting ready, but I do not eat for an hour. Now, let's do the math again. Dishes in the sink at eight, three hours to 11 o'clock. 11 to seven, eight hours. Three plus eight is 11 hours. Get up in the morning and add one more hour. That's 12 hours. Guess what I've done for myself with that? I've given myself 12 out of 24 hours of the day to have my metabolism in fat burning, metabolism optimizing, health elevating mode. That timing of eating, okay, is one easy way that anybody can follow in order to be able to take that step um, uh, towards health.
I love how you simplified that because even me like listening to that, I'm like, man, this, I mean, this seems very, very doable, even like in the context of as a trainer, I'm talking to my clients often about nutrition and how to eat healthier and stuff. And I'm like, oh, like my, my clients could definitely follow this adv advice and it could be very manageable to incorporate that into their day to again, help to optimize their health and to, you know, reduce their eating window if they're looking to, to lose weight and that sort of thing. Regarding the foods to include throughout that 12 hour window that you just alluded to, you mentioned at the beginning that, you know, sometimes people will jump to going vegan. Obviously people also jump to the other extreme. They go carnivore. They're looking for these quick fix diets to improve their health. And a lot of times they're just not manageable long-term for health reasons, just for habit reasons, that sort of thing. If you were in a position where you were looking to drop body weight, body fat, looking to improve your diet quality, overall health, knowing what you know about habits and nutrition, what would be a few simple switches you would make immediately that would be maintainable for the long term? Before I jump into there, I just want to make one more comment. That 12 hours that we just talked about a few moments ago, that is fasting. You're not eating. And so intermittent fasting is really just that natural part of not eating. And 12 hours works. Research studies have shown that you can actually lose weight. If you go to 16 hours, you know, that 16, eight uh, uh, fasting cycle for intermittent fasting, that works a little bit better, but most people can actually manage as you kind of just was reflect, re reflecting back. Most people can manage 12 hours. Now, what about adding the foods? What are some of the, you call it swaps? Um, you know, it's a great, that's a great, it's a great question. How do you swap? What do you swap? What are some easy swaps you can make? Well, easy is kind of individual because people get stuck on their habits. But I'll tell you, just sort of off the top of my head, if I were coaching somebody, you know, and I and I teach courses uh, to people all around the world on how to actually make these swaps and come up with better behaviors. I mean, these are sort of online courses that I do. One thing to do is to swap out soda. Pick your favorite soda. You come in a red can or a blue can or any can for that matter. Okay. Sodas, empty calories, ton of sugar in it, added sugar, and often a lot of artificial preservatives and chemicals and flavorings. All these things damage your health by damaging your gut microbiome and interfering with your DNA and all kinds of other parts of your health defenses. We've talked about this on a past um, podcast. Swap out your soda for one of three beverages, any three, all three, that have been shown to improve your health and improve your metabolism. And help you fight body fat. So if you're looking for fitness, okay, remove the loose soda, soda and add any one of these three: coffee, plain coffee, or you can add nut milk, tea, any kind of tea. Green tea is actually good, but it turns out black tea is also good. And some of these fermented teas, like oolong tea, matcha, they're also really good for your metabolism and fighting body fat. And of course, water. Water is something that, you know, we don't tend to think about, but hydration is really critical to help our cells stay nice and moist so they can actually perform them. They can, they can be at their fittest as well. And a lot of times, you know, people go into these diets uh, where they don't think about the most elemental thing, which is that you have to stay hydrated. And it's, it's so important to stay hydrated. And I know another way that can help people stay hydrated is by eating more fruits and vegetables. You know, we've talked about the importance of this stuff in past conversations, talked about the importance of fiber and, and what these, these types of foods can do for us. But there's a lot of people, I think, just in my experience, that when they're going from looking to transform an unhealthy dietary pattern to a healthier one, one of the things they might say is, well, I really don't like that many fruits and vegetables. Have you found in your own experience and just people that you've talked to just some simple steps somebody can take to make fruits or vegetables taste better? You know, people always ask me, how do I eat? Dr. Lee, how do you eat? You must, you know, all this stuff about food is medicine. So, you know, they, they want to, they, they're always wanting to dig into my own, what kind of diet I follow. And what I tell people is I don't actually follow a diet. I kind of don't believe in diets, to be honest with you. It's sort of, it's, it's always a loaded topic for me, but I do have something I, I pursue every single day, and that is a way, an approach to eating. And I call that approach Mediterranean style eating. Mediterranean plus Asian. You don't have to fuse them together. It could be either. The point being that uh, if you take the traditional foods of any of the Mediterranean countries, yes, Italy, 
Greece, Spain, France, of course, you think about those as Mediterranean countries south of France. But in fact, there's 20 different countries in the Mediterranean. Okay, that's an amazing amount of cultures that all take fruits and vegetables, nuts and legumes, greens, vegetables, uh, root vegetables, and they find delicious ways of actually coming up with them. Same deals in Asia. If you go to Asia, you think about Chinese, Japanese, Vietnamese, Thai, right? But actually, there are 40 countries that all, all make up Asia. And uh, and by the way, it's even more, both of these cultures, food cultures, healthiest food cultures in history in the world were once connected by the Silk Road. This is like a trading route from 2000 years ago that where people, the traders were on camelback were actually trading the foods that they were eating as well. So this is not a new diet. This is an old pattern of eating. And so what I tell people to do, well, first, I wrote two books, Eat to Beat Disease and Eat to Beat Your Diet. And in them, I deliberately created lists with checkboxes of foods that science has shown us from the produce section and from the nuts and legumes section, for example, that have the scientific evidence and the clinical evidence are benefiting your health. All right. So I tell people, if you, if you open up my book and take a Sharpie and, and just circle all the foods that you already like, you know this, everyone's got, there's 200 foods in one of the books, 100 foods in the other one, 300 foods. Everyone can find something they like in these categories. Start with those, okay? And then you're going to already be ahead of the game because you already like them. If you want to choose a vegetable, I don't know, I'm going to take a, I'm going to throw one out there that people might not recognize the name, um, but you might see in the grocery store. How about this? Cavolo Nero, all right? What the heck is that? It's called dinosaur kale. You can actually find it if you look closely in the vegetable section of a grocery store even an average grocery store, actually this, the, it's, a, it's, it's a dark leafy green. It's kind of kale. And in fact, if you look at the pattern of it, it's kind of pebbly. It actually kind of looks like dinosaur skin, right? Like Jurassic salad, right? So the, the, the thing is that how would you use it? How would you cook it? No idea, right? So if you're not familiar with it, here's what it is. You pick up your phone, you type in the name Cavolo Nero or any vegetable you're not familiar with, type up Mediterranean recipe, all right? and hit search and it'll come up with recipes from Italy, from Spain, from any of these Mediterranean countries. And in fact, if you hit video and on the search results, now you'll see somebody showing you how to cook it. All right. This is actually where we are today. It, there's no excuse to think about healthy plant-based foods, which are definitely healthier um, as their rabbit food or salad bar only. We can lean into the foods that have been deliciously prepared in these old cultures uh, for hundreds, if not thousands of years. And there's so many variations on it. Um, it takes a little bit of time to figure all this out. But when you do, the reward is a great taste that you'll remember, uh, like your new favorite dish that also gives you great health. You talked about the castaway reference, and you mentioned that people ask you often how you eat, and that you're not a fan of diets. But what I would love to know is given all of your research and everything that you've studied, if you were trapped on an island and you only were allowed to take five foods with you, what would they be and why? Uh, I would take uh, green tea, tea leaves. Provide, I guess I would need a magnifying glass to use the sun to catch them on fire. Or I would be like naked and afraid. You need to have like a, a, a fire starter, a striker, but you have to heat water. Uh, so hopefully you had water uh, on the island. Uh, but tea... Definitely. It's hydrating uh, and also it's nutrient dense, believe it or not. It's packed with these bioactives that help you, your mental state, lower your blood pressure, how good for your heart health, your circulation, improves your immunity, um, in, improves your metabolism as well, uh, glucose control, everything. So green tea is one of them. I would say I would bring my favorite tree nuts. Okay. Now tree nuts are a big family. Almonds, cashews, macadamias, pecans, walnuts. You know, I might have my own favorites. I mean, you know, I, I like macadamias a lot. Um, I also like cashews, but, but it could be any tree nut. I would have great source of protein, a good source of healthy fats. Um, and it's got dietary fiber, good for my gut microbiome. And you can actually, you know, eat them as a snack, or you could sit down and, you know, you can have nuts really as a meal if you were on a desert island. And by the way, if I caught a fish <laughs> on the island, I could sprinkle some nuts uh, on them as well and make it kind of a fancy meal, right? So that would be um, the second category. 
I think I would um, love to bring something, uh, 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 something that would please my palate. Probably be some chocolate. I'd probably bring cacao powder, like a chocolate bar would melt on a tropical island, but a cacao powder. Hey, I'm boiling my water for tea. I can now make a little bit of, you know, um, a cacao uh, hot chocolate or a cold chocolate uh, uh, during the day. And that actually, it's got cocoa poly polyphenol, so it would be really, really great. You know, and then I think, you know, I, I'm on an island. Depends. You didn't say how long I'm going to be on that island. I suppose if I had to, if I had to plant something, you know, I mean, I'd have to have something that I, I could get the seeds on and that, that the soil was hospitable to. But I, I guess what I would say is if I had to, if I, I could just bring like a week on a, on a desert island or something or a deserted island, I'd bring a jar of sun-dried tomatoes packed in olive oil. You know, the kind you can get in a, the grocery store in the middle aisle, right? They have all these Italian brands, not the super dry ones because they're kind of difficult to eat. Packed in olive oil, they're nice and soft. Man, do they give you this great umami tomato flavor. Um, and, you know, I, I, I could whip out a, a, a slice of whole grain bread or sourdough bread and just put on some slices of, uh, of uh, uh, sun-dried tomatoes and, you know, maybe sprinkle some crushed nuts on it. And then you, gotta, you have yourself a nice meal. Like, I'm looking for ways to light up my life. And, of course, protein is really important. Uh, I'm a, you know, I'm not a vegan. Uh, I'm an omnivore. I do eat mostly plants. Uh, everything I've just talked about are plant-derived foods. But something that I know can help me survive on a desert island would be tinned fish, tinned seafood. A lot of people don't appreciate this because when I was a kid, I would recoil when, at, the, at the thought of eating fish in a can, right? That's cat food, isn't it? You go in and open it up. Man, it smells just like what the cat would eat. But if you look at the Mediterranean, if you look at Spain, Portugal, Italy, Greece, uh, south of France, there is a long tradition of, of cooking and tinning sardines, mackerel, tuna, uh, other kinds of shellfish, mussels packed in olive oil with lots of delicious spices and herbs. They're not very big, so it's easy to carry along with you. They're already cooked, so you don't need to worry about cooking them. And they also would make a great complement to it. So you can kind of see how, where I'm going with this, uh, Doug. I'm a foodie. I enjoy my food. So I'm, not, I, I'm, I'm thinking about things that I would actually enjoy sipping or eating uh, uh, if I were stuck on a, on, a, on a deserted island for a little while. I love that. And it seems like you covered like a variety of different types of foods that you would include um, if you were stranded on an island that you could have with you. But getting back to like the theme of our of our com of our conversation, I think that when people are trying to improve their health, they're trying to, again, drop body fat, they're trying to lose that 15, 20, 25 pounds. One of the biggest struggles I've seen with my clients over the years is their ability to stay motivated. I think it's easy when you have that initial like adrenaline rush where you're trying to make a change that things are like you're excited and things are good. And then when the when the things kind of set in a bit, it's like, oh, I'm not motivated anymore. Um, what are what are some things that you would advise people to do that can help make their motivation last as they're trying to make some sort of health change? Three things. OK, number one. When it comes to diet, focus on choosing foods that are not only healthy, but that you find delicious, not that you'll tolerate, but that you'll look forward to eating and don't eat the same thing all the time. Get diversity. All right. If I told you, you could go to a small town in Italy and eat healthy health activating foods by going to the typical restaurant and picking off that menu, you know, you probably like, Oh, I could, I could imagine myself doing that. That's not so bad. Um, so I think eating foods that you actually look forward to eating or having foods, Planning for foods that you look forward to eating is motivating. That's a good way to always dangle that carrot, so to speak, in front of you. Number two, find a way to measure um, your progress because numbers count, right? And uh, there's a couple of devices now that are, I think, really, really cool. Uh, these are technology pieces that I encourage people to just find out more about. One of them is called Lumen. It measures the metabolism. I don't know if you're, have you seen this thing? Yeah, I have. All right. It is a breathalyzer for your metabolism. And what's really cool about it is that it kind of looks like a, I mean, it looks like a vape pen. That's not, vaping is not healthy for you, but it's small. And you just 
learn, you train it to breathe in and out. And on your phone, it'll tell you if you measure it even once in the morning, it'll tell you how your metabolism is doing overall. And, uh, and, you know, I, and I have been speaking with the researchers behind this, and I think there's a lot more coming along with the results, but having that number, knowing that you're actually scoring, you know, first thing you get up, you wake up, you do your score and like, you knock it out of the park. Like I, I, I score like in the ones, which is like the top score every single day. And I'm like, yeah, that's pretty motivating. Like I'm keep on doing what I'm doing. Okay. Um, there's another thing called, um, Fit track. I don't know if you've heard of Fit track, but it's a, it's a, it looks like a weight. It looks like a scale, something you put in your bathroom to step on and see what, which way. But no, it actually uses electrical impedance on your bare feet and it actually beams it up and it helps you calculate bone muscle fat. And it actually gives you um, kind of a, a, a reading of your overall fitness by tissue compartments. That's a good thing. You're gaining muscle, you're losing fat. Hopefully, your bone's not going to change. Um, but, uh, but muscle and fat, that ratio and even water, it will tell you about water too. Those are really good to know. So having some numbers are really helpful. And then the third thing I think is to do it, do it with a friend. If you can actually get on the same page with somebody who you like, uh, you respect that you can get along with and you can train together, work out together, embark on a healthier life together. You don't feel so alone. And when you, when you're feeling a little bit flagging, Talk to your buddy, um, you know, it could be a guy or a gal or whatever. And, um, you know, I think a lot of times that'll um, help to prop you up. Things, doing things with other people are always a little bit more fun than doing it by yourself. One of the things that demotivates people is plateaus, specifically weight loss plateaus when they've, again, they're looking to lose 15, 20, 25, 30 pounds, you know, and maybe they're having some progress initially. And then all of a sudden, the scale stops moving, whatever device they're using to track their progress, just it's not moving in the right direction. I guess two things on that. Like what, what do you think typically hap is happening when somebody hits a weight loss plateau? And then what's your advice to somebody who has a hard time when they hit a plateau? Okay. A lot of things can, can lead you to a plateau because our lives, you know, every people's lives are complicated. No matter what you're doing to work out or, or eat the right way or try to get enough sleep or manage your mental stress, you know, their emotional stress. Those are all the healthy things, but so many other things weigh in on our part of our lives, right? We've got, we all have got, we all think about our finances. We think about our mortgage. We think about electrical bills. We think about our education. We think about our car payments. We think about our work stress. There's a million things. All those things can contribute to derailing our behavior, derailing our sleep. You know, stress is uh, almost impossible to, avoid at all times. A little stress is actually turns out to be healthy for you. But I, we live in such a complicated world, Doug, that, you know, we, I think most of us are living with this kind of this cloud of chronic stress that's chasing us if it's not already over our head. So we got to live with this stuff. All these things can contribute to your body responding to them by saying, you know what, we're going to take a break here for this weight loss thing. So that's one thing. And, and when you track it down, plateaus are almost always associated somehow with some kind of stress or some kind of behavior change, even subtle. And you got to really be able to audit yourself of what am I doing or what am I not doing or what am I doing differently? So, you know, I, I'm not giving you a hand wavy answer. I'm just saying there's so many factors that can lead to plateaus. By the way, a true medical condition can also lead to a plateau. You start on a new medicine, you come off a of medicine, you have a disease underlying it, you know, um, maybe you're entering into type two diabetes, you know, and all of a sudden, like, your hormones are shifting, or you go into menopause, your, your hormones are shifting. These are all the types of factors I'm actually telling you that can actually make a, a big difference. So how do you do a reset? Or how do you actually move forward? Let's, let's forget about reset. Let's talk about moving forward, making progress. I'll tell you um, a simple way to make progress. A simple way to make progress that anybody can do is to skip breakfast. I, I, just, I actually do that myself. Uh, uh, pretty often because of my schedule. But now think about it. You have just added, holy cow, you've just added another four hours to your um, 12 hours. So now you've gotten to 16 hours. Now you're into intermittent fasting in the formula way. And if you really want to actually kind of take it even further, if you can muscle it, if you want to kind of like jumpstart your weight loss again, you know what? Have a little snack around lunchtime and don't eat anything. Don't eat any snacks in the afternoon. Wait till dinner. 
compress your eating, you know, into the smallest window possible, you will definitely lose weight, more weight over time. That triggers your body, your metabolism into burning down extra body fat. That's a, that's a way of actually, you know, kind of like startling your body, pushing it harder uh, to be able to, to do it. Like, don't go to the deserted island, but you know, like that's a, but that's kind of like the, the direction that you can head um, uh, to, to do that. Now you want to jumpstart your progress again. Um, and somewhere between managing those silent forces in your life, cutting down the volume of what you're eating and then eating less, you know, like, or, or skipping a meal, you'll actually start to make a little bit more forward progress. Oh, and by the way, if you kind of like look at yourself in the mirror and you're like, yeah, you know what? I, I started drinking again, you know, like there could be some behavior thing that actually is the, you know, pin the tail on the donkey. So if somebody's listening to this and they're like, all right, like that method might sound like unmanageable for me. Like maybe I'm not eating enough calories. Maybe I, I don't know if I want to just commit to, you know, either skipping a meal or cutting down significantly on calories. Do you recommend that somebody at least develop some awareness around how much food that they're eating? So start to track, like how many calories they're taking in? Because I think sometimes what happens is people underestimate how much they're eating every single day. 100%. Uh, you know, this is another thing that requires a little bit of, um, commitment to do, but, uh, but anybody with a cell phone that has a notes app on it can do it. This is what I tell people to do. Pull out your phone, whip it out, open the notes and, and do make a food diary, create a food log, audit what you're eating. Everything that you're putting in your mouth, audit it. breakfast, lunch, dinner, any snacks, write down the time you're eating it and write down what you're eating and also write down how much you're eating, you know? And you don't need to, you don't need a scale, but estimate it, whatever makes sense to you as a, as a, as an easy way to remember it. You know, I had a piece of chicken, the size of a shoe. All right. Well, you know, <laughs> that tells you something. Right. And then as far as some of the other habits that aren't food related, that aren't sleep related, like, let's talk specifically about exercise. What are some of your favorite things that you do for yourself to to maintain a healthy body fat percentage, to, to maintain optimal health? Like what are some things you do exercise wise to, to help you? You know, in addition to working out at the gym as often as I can, you know, uh, a, a few times a week, I do a lot of traveling. And so travel is tough. You know, you're, you're on a plane or on a train or wherever, and then you get to a place you, you got work to do. Um, and then you're whipped, you're tired. But one of the things that I found is after a meal every single day, if I'm able to walk, briskly for 30 minutes. That gets my heart rate up. That gives me physical activity, moving. I'm burning down calories. I'm staying active. And, and by the way, you can track your steps if you have, you know, a phone that, you know, they, they have all these tracking things you can know about, about how many steps you have. I don't say focus on the number of steps. I fo say focus on the time and trying to get my heart rate up. So I, I walk briskly. I, I, you know, some people are biohackers and they, every number matters a lot to them. I totally respect that. I mean, more power to you if you're able to be that kind of person that keeps track and can audit all your numbers. But I think for a lot of people, they just want those some simple things they can do. Go for a walk for 30 minutes after a meal. It could be after lunch, it could be after dinner. That's a good way to actually move forward. As far as, as longevity goes, I know we've talked about that in previous conversations. Talk to me about the importance of muscle mass and building muscle as we age. If you remember when we were kids and we saw our grandparents or saw other people's grandparents, what was the first thing that we noticed besides their white hair? We noticed that they kind of were like, they had thin arms and thin legs, you know, a, a lot of people. I mean, he's not obviously somebody who's obese, but, um, and then when you shook their hand, man, their arm was like really light. They don't have a lot of muscle mass. They've got bone and skin, right? Like, and that's, that's exactly what happens as we age, we begin losing muscle mass. There's a medical term for it when it becomes really severe. It's called sarcopenia. And to some extent that occurs to everyone. Like, you know, the old saying, use it or lose it. Well, a lot of people as they get older just are less at physically active. Lots of reasons, not just, not just because they're older. Um, it happens over decades. And, and as you're not, as you're not using your muscles, you start to not keep them built. Most people don't realize you have to really maintain your muscle mass. And then of course, diet, nutrition, you know, older people, as they get, as we age, you want healthy aging, you want to have a healthy appetite. 
when you start eating less and less and being picky with your food, a lot of people, nursing homes, you know, they, they push aside their trade. They just don't want to eat. All right. You don't eat. You're not, you're not taking in protein. You're not, you need protein to build your muscles. Okay. You need other micronutrients as well. Um, so this idea of not moving, not eating enough protein, you don't move it and feed it, you're going to lose it. And that's really dangerous because it turns out that muscle mass is correlated with longevity. If you have more muscle mass, you're likely to live longer. Okay. People focus on body fat and things like that, but it actually muscle mass is the most important thing. Good muscle mass, uh, basically is, is your fortune telling card to say that you're likely to live longer. So, uh, and, and by the way, this sneaks up on us, right? It's not, it's not like you go from 20 to 60, uh, overnight. It's that you start losing muscle mass in your forties, frankly. Uh, you know, you kind of like around that bend, it's easier to lose muscle mass. So you, we got to work at that a little bit harder. One, one of the things when you take a look at um, longevity, right? Look at the blue zones. My good friend, Dan Butner, who's the journalist who popularized the blue zones. Basically, uh, when I tell him and I ask him like, okay, so what, what are people living there like? Oh, they eat healthy for sure. You know what? They're walking every single day. Almost everywhere they go, they're super physically active. And they're doing some manual labor. You know, they're picking up things themselves, moving boxes by themselves, hauling groceries back, you know, by rolling a, a, a cart. They are not sitting in their SUV, you know, uh, with, uh, you know, auto drive <laughs> taking them home. So I think that this idea of, you know, we, we now know you really want to be able to watch your muscle mass, grow your muscle mass, eat protein, stay active. Those are some of the formulas uh, for living long. Staying on that theme, what would you say are some, if you had to pick like five non-negotiables for people when it comes to the foods that they that they eat um, over the long term, what would they be? And the reason I say that is because there's so much confusion out there. You see seed oils are bad. You see, you know, red meat's bad. You see all these things that when people are trying to change their health, they get so confused about what to do. I mean, then you have other people that are saying vegetables are toxic. Like in it, and I think that just creates like it, it almost makes people not want to change because they're like, I, I have no idea what to do. Yeah. And we kind of touched on this at the beginning, but what would you say are some non-negotiables? Yeah. Well, you know, so I like your term non-negotiable. So what are the things that you really want to adhere to when it comes to your diet? So I'll try to give you my my thoughts on this, how I would do it or how I do do it, um, in the non-negotiable ways. Number one, it's non-negotiable for me to go with the first thing that I hear uh, on social media or, or, or the internet. I, it's not negotiable for me. I always need to double check the information I'm hearing, and I always look for trusted sources. And the problem we have now is there's so many voices, so many sources out there. It's easy to get attracted to somebody's idea then like, and, and then get swept up in a wave. It's not negotiable for me uh, to follow something without a trusted source verifying it. Check your own information. All right. Number one, non-negotiable for me, I have to live, in order to live healthy, I have to keep this light burning in my head, this candle burning in my head that reminds me, cut down or cut out processed meats. Now, a lot of people listening to this might already be vegetarian or whatever, but more likely people are eating a lot of different things, right? Especially if you're trying to be fitness and you're, and you know, and as you said, the other direction is people like, you know, eat a lot of meat or carn the carnivore diet. Processed meats, we're talking about the kind of stuff you get in a deli, the pastrami, the salami, the bologna, the stuff that, you know, honestly, we grew up eating in, in the school lunch, you know, your mom packed it went to the cafeteria at school, they served it to you. It turns out that that's a level one carcinogen by the World Health Organization. It, those things, when you eat them over and over and over again, actually cause cancer. Not negotiable for me. So, and I say cut down or cut out because every now and then, knock yourself out. You know, you want to hark back to fifth grade, go for it, you know. Um, but what I said is not negotiable is putting out that candle. I always have that thing burning in my head. I always remember that. Cut down or cut out processed meats, Okay. Number two. Number three, I, I always have plants with every meal. I always look for what the plant-based foods are. And by the way, there's so many foods that are plant-based. They're all 
um, you know, a tomato. You know, people go, ah, oh, tomato sauce, it's not healthy for you. If you actually choose wisely and get a good tomato sauce, make it yourself, you know, or, or get a good quality tomato sauce, it's totally good for you. In fact, it's been studied by research uh, as an example. Uh, beans, think about it. Beans are something very simple, very cheap, very easy to prepare. I mean, they're, you can even get them that are cooked in a can. Um, and these have been studied by researchers. They're gut healthy. And so I always sort of say, non-negotiable, uh, make sure there's vegetables, you know, greens are good, colorful foods are good, but don't forget about things in the middle aisle uh, that you're, we're not supposed to go into, but beans and canned goods, uh, vegetables and legumes, also really, really good. Uh, for you. That's not negotiable. Fourth thing that's not negotiable to me, it's got to taste great. I will not eat something that doesn't taste great. Occasionally it happens and I regret it, honestly, but I try to make every decision uh, a, a shot on goal. And so it's got to really please me. And that's motivating to me because it makes me look for healthy things that I enjoy tasting. It's kind of like a little hunting game that I actually have. And it's not negotiable. Like if somebody says, look, I got some healthy food for you and it tastes like crap. No, thank you. I just won't eat it. I will wait for a meal where I actually can um, uh, taste something. And then I think that another thing that is non-negotiable is really the idea of, um, of never cooking yourself. And the reason is you should always find some time every week to cook for yourself. That's tending to yourself. That's like taking a shower brushing your teeth, exercising. Cooking for yourself should be instinctive as something you do for yourself. Non-negotiable for me to only eat takeout or only eat prepared meals. That's where you can kind of slip slide into trouble when it comes to your health. I want to talk about planning for a second because as we've talked about some of the different you know, adversities and, and struggles people can have when it comes to wanting to lose weight and improve their health, I think planning is a big one. And a lot like, like yourself, people are busy, they have kids, they have jobs, they're traveling, they're running around, they're picking kids up from school, they got homework. What have been some of your best practices over the years when it comes to planning your meals and planning what you eat that have helped you, you know, maintain your health? One thing uh, for planning is it's not realistic for me and probably for a lot of people to have fresh food, cook, freshly cooked food for dinner every single night. It's a lot of work. You know, I mean, that sort of that was the leave it to beaver era, you know, where people were cooking or, or, you know, caveman era where people were actually cooking every night. I, I like to, for me, planning meals, especially dinner, where I can have leftovers that I'm willing to eat again that are tasty, it can be heated up. That's practical and easy to plan for. Now, you just like, if you can plan instead of five days or seven days of, of cooking or whatever, if you plan meals that like three of those meals can have leftovers whether it's for lunch or for the next day for dinner, you've just saved yourself like 40% of the work. That's actually really practical, cheaper. You save money doing that, which is useful. And you get to eat something tasty. If you plan tasty, um, you get to have something tasty twice. All right. So that's something that's really practical uh, for me. I also think from a planning perspective, uh, I look for a day where I'm going to go shopping. Uh, so I make it the same day. And I know that day, like, so if it's a regular routine where I'm going to go shopping that way, I, I don't go, oh man, I was too busy to go shopping this week. So I always have some fresh food and I'm always able to replenish it. And when I go shopping, by the way, I will make a grocery list. And when I teach my course, uh, ATP disease or my metabolism masterclass, I've got shopping lists for people that they can download, make it easy for them. But anybody can make their own shopping list. The, the thing that you, um, that I want to do when I'm, when I'm shopping, I, I do my planning, but I also keep myself flexible. If I see something that's fresh in the market I didn't plan on and I'm like, oh man, that'd be good. I'll actually, I keep myself spontaneous so that planning doesn't become boring. So I'm willing to be, still be flexible uh, even as I've actually planned uh, a grocery list. And I would say the, the other thing that I try to do from a planning perspective is I try to eat roughly at the same times every day. Because if you don't, you're going to find yourself like eating when you're, when you don't want to eat or, or eating too much or eating junky food whenever it's available to you. So I think having some discipline, some regimen of timing is actually help, helpful. Last question around uh, last, last question that I think relates to this is 
if you're out to dinner, if you're out to lunch, what are what are some things that you're doing to make sure that you're not not eating with the people that you're with, but you're also trying to make the best decision possible? Yeah. Well, look, I I I very much enjoy the uh, eating out. I I love the idea of going to uh, a restaurant that I know has good food or a place I've been or, or, or even trying a new place. And what I do to make sure I'm doing something good for myself is I open the menu and I immediately look through the offerings and the things that catch my eye uh, first are when they, you know how restaurants, a lot of restaurants now will um, list what the ingredients are in their food. I look for the ones that I recognize are healthy. When I teach my course, my online course, I always tell people, look, you, it, it might be hard at first, make a list for yourself, but you're going to start to recognize, oh, you know what? There's some uh, broccoli sprouts. Okay, that's good for you. Or, oh, here's some uh, radishes. That's good for you. So you start to recognize these healthy foods. And what I do is I, before I make my decision what to eat, I kind of take stock of what's, what they're offering that has healthy uh, ingredients in it. And then I think what I do is I think about ordering something I, I I first put the vegetables on my list of what to order. So, you know, a lot of times like, oh, vegetables are on the side uh, or, but I'll look for what is the green or the vegetable or the colorful food that I actually want to order first before I go for whatever the protein is going to be. So I, I sort of invert my order and, and the vegetable is sort of like what I focus on first. And then I'll add the protein uh, to it um, to complement it. That way I'm making sure I'm getting some of that healthy uh, food in. Uh, you know what? I respect my dining partner's choices. And so I don't, I'm not judgmental about that. I just know that to, I've got a responsibility for one person and that's me. Every time I sit down at a restaurant, every shot on goal counts, every meal, every time we put some, make a decision to eat something, you know, counts for our health. And so I, I try to make every shot count. Absolutely. Well, Dr. Lee, I think this is a great place for us to end our conversation. Thank you so much for coming on. I really enjoyed this and I think the audience is going to as well. Really quick, if, if they want to learn more about your work, your books, they want to connect with you on social media, where's the best place to do that? Yeah, come to my website, drwilliamleeli.com. You can follow me on social. I'm on all the platforms. Uh, my handle is at drwilliamleeli, drwilliamleeli. And, um, you know, and I, and, and I will tell you about my books are anywhere, uh, books are sold, Amazon or wherever, Barnes and Nobles and wherever your favorite bookseller is, eat to beat disease, eat to beat your diet. The first one is about overall health. The second one is how do you take your metabolism to that next level? The word diet is a trick word because it's not a diet book. It's an anti-diet book that shows how you can actually enjoy your food, love your food, to love your health and your metabolism. And, you know, I invite people to take my um, online courses and come to my master classes because that's where I go real deep and to teach you how to integrate these practices that we've been talking about, Doug, into your everyday life and be able to really enjoy the foods that you are encountering and making decisions on. I'll be able to include the links to your socials, your website, et cetera, in the show notes. Dr. Lee, wanted to once again, thank you for coming on the show. This has been awesome. Always a pleasure, Doug. Thank you for having me. You got it. Thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, I really think you're going to like this video as well. I'll see you there.